What is going on my fellow nerds? Operator Otter here, and today what I'd like to discuss is why Bone Spear sucks. Okay, no it doesn't suck, but there is an evolution of Necromancer builds coming to light in terms of their efficiency for specific content, and unfortunately for Abattoir Zir, Bone Spear is not on the list for a top tier Necromancer build. Regardless, I was able to achieve a tier 12 run with Bone Spear and want to go into detail about multiple variants of Bone Spear for Abattoir Zir, and then let you as the player decide what best fits your playstyle. I will be discussing all manners of different viable gear, skill, aspect, vampiric power, and paragon choices, as well as comparing them to other choices so that you as the player can weigh the pros and cons and create what you feel is the best Bone Spear variant for you. So, let's talk about it. I want to take a few minutes to explain some threshold breakpoints for Necromancers, as well as explain a little bit about why Bone Spear is having trouble in higher tiers. If you're here for the meat and potatoes of the builds, head to the builds intro chapter in the description below. If you are a newer player or getting into min-maxing, I recommend sitting back and enjoying what I'm about to discuss. Let's get to it. The two limiting factors for Bone Spear build's performance in Abattoir Zir is going to be defense and essence regeneration. We need a way to stay alive, especially against those very high damage output Seekers, and we need a way to keep our essence high against squirrely targets that are tanky, aka the Seekers, again. Let's talk defense first, and then the tools we as Necromancers have to achieve this goal. The first tool I want to discuss is benchmark thresholds for defensive stats needed for Abattoir Zir, namely our resistances. For elemental resistances, we will need 70% across the board, and when utilizing the Skeletal Warrior's Defender Sacrifice, Paragon Board, Natural Intelligence, and the Gems and the Jewelry, this is relatively easy to achieve, so I'm not going to go too much detail on how to achieve this. For armor, the breakpoint needed is 14,100. This will properly give us the maximum value of 85% physical resistance against level 158 monsters. There are two ways we can achieve this breakpoint. First, we can use Disobedience, and with this, we only need to run 10,000 base armor to achieve this breakpoint once it's fully stacked. But therein lies a problem by doing it this way. It needs to stack. So, when I was against the Seekers and they deal their damage on the initial engagement, if my armor isn't stacked, I was usually toast. But if I did survive the initial engagement and could stack it, then I was okay. And it opens up some damage nodes in the Paragon board that I will discuss later. The second way to achieve this is to actually get 14,100 base armor breakpoint without even running disobedience. And to achieve this, I needed to grab every single armor node and important resistance nodes in the Paragon board, insert skulls into my jewelry, and change some affects priorities in my gear. We will go more into detail on this later in the video. Now let's talk about Shielding Storm, and a highly overlooked affects that we as Necromancers haven't needed to run because, well, it wasn't needed. But now it is. That affects as barrier generation. Barrier generation increases the rate at which we can generate shields using our shielding storm aspect. And this means that if we run all barrier generation slots available to us in both rings, helm, armor, and offhand, we can theoretically achieve 105% barrier generation and turn the 5% shield per tick to 10.25% per tick. Bone storm deals damage two times a second. So in theory, if we were able to hit all three seekers that are storm, this will increase the barrier generation from 30% of our total life per second to 61.5% of our total life per second. This, in a weird pseudo way, literally doubles our defensive potential and is nothing to be slept on. So anywhere we can grab this affix, depending on what variant you decide to run, we want it. Now, let's talk about damage reduction. The most reliable and high value affix and paragon node we have via damage reduction that can stay up most often is going to be the damage reduction from shadow damage over time affected enemies. We will apply the shadow damage over time by utilizing Corpse Explosion Miasma to achieve this. We'll also discuss a nifty little gear swap that will help us with this as well. Lastly, let's discuss another form of defense that includes anything that makes enemies deal less damage. It's not that you are taking less damage, but rather is another form of damage reduction that makes the actual enemies deal less damage. And the two ways that Necros have to achieve this are Decrepify and the Darkness Glyph, which once again, requires us to deal shadow damage to an enemy multiple times to achieve maximum value. So are you seeing a pattern yet with the shadow damage and defensive utility? These four defensive forms being elemental and physical resistance, barrier generation, damage reduction, and enemies dealing less damage are what we need to maximize in order to stay alive against the Seekers. And if only one of them is not online, we're most likely dead. So as we move forward in the different variations, this is something we need to keep in mind, as well as understanding that in order to stay alive, we have to get into the fight for Shielding Storm to work. We can no longer really fight from range. Now let's talk about Essence Management. For Bone Spear Necros, there are four reliable ways I found to achieve Essence Regeneration. Those are Black River Multiple Corpse Explosions plus the Sacrilegious Ring and Grim Harvest, Aspect of Exposed Flesh, Tibalt's Will, and a Basic Skill Generator. 
in whatever variant you decide to run, you'll be utilizing three of these four forms of essence generation, but it is not practical to run all four. It is possible to run all four, but it means we have to sacrifice the natural armor and multiple storm generator of Lidless, which resulted in less consistent and optimal runs. These two concepts just discussed are the two main driving factors and the puzzle I tried to solve in order for Bonespear to perform in Avatar Zir. The issue lies in that I could not maximize the efficiency of both, which is why Bonespear cannot compete with Shadow Builds for higher tiers, and I want to express why. The main issue lies with the limited number of skill selection. In order for Bonespear to function, I believe we need the following skills. 1. Bone Spear as our main damage dealer. 2. Bone Storm as our defensive generator for Shielding Storm. 3. Decrepify to lower the cooldown of our skills, but more importantly apply the damage reduction. 4. Corpse Explosion to activate Flesh Eater and apply our damage reduction from Shadow Damage over time afflicted enemies and the Darkness Glyph. 5. Corpse Tendrils to activate Aspect of Grassing Veins and allow us to hit that 90% crit hit chance breakpoint. Which then leaves the 6th skill open. Here I found three options. We can run a generator via Reap for faster dungeon clears due to the attack speed steroid and more damage reduction. We can also run Bone Splinters for best essence regen against the Seekers. Lastly, we can run Blood Mist to allow our Darkness Glyph to stack utilizing the aspect of Explosive Mist and restack our barrier to 100% from aspect of Shielding Storm. But I couldn't have both the Blood Mist and the generator. If I chose to use a generator, I could clear the dungeon faster and theoretically kill the Seekers faster, but if the Seekers spread out and negate my Shielding Storm from hitting all three targets, or they step out of the Blighted Miasma, then my damage reduction completely falls off and I had a hard time surviving. If I chose to use Blood Mist, I could survive for a th longer theoretical time, but now I can't keep my Essence high enough to consistently attack the Seekers. This means my DPS will fall off dramatically and can possibly prevent Flicker Step passive of reducing my Evade cooldown and consequently my Bone Storm uptime, which will then fall off and if Bone Storm deactivates, I'm dead. And this is the conundrum of Bone Spear, and why it can't function consistently and anything above tier 10s. I know I kind of rushed through the reasonings as to why Bone Spear struggles to function in higher tiers of Avatar Zero, but I honestly don't think this is a bad thing. It gives the game a sort of tier list in the build selection for different content. Bone Spear is without a doubt the best Necromancer build for PvE speed clearing anything up to tier 100 and tier 7 in Avatar of Zero. But once the damage output becomes high enough against us, Bone Spear just can't keep up. But that's okay, because we now have a build that's incredible for 90% of the content for Diablo 4. And with that in mind, and all the bad news out of the way, let's actually talk about the different variants for Bone Spear in Avatar of Zero and let you as the player decide what will best fit your playstyle. As we move forward, I will take each piece with every variant selection and explain why we can run it. At the end, I will coagulate everything into two variants that each have a build link in the description below. Let's get started. For skills, regardless of the variant, I ran these five core skills. Bone Spear, Bone Storm, Corpse Explosion, Corpse Tendrils, and Decrepify. For the sixth skill, I found three options to be practical. Reap, Bone Splinters, and Blood Mist. Reap, I found, was the best for the dungeon clear speed as it gave me a massive attack speed steroid on my damage cycles and allowed me to kill each pack faster. The damage reduction is absolutely goaded against the Seekers in tandem with Aspect of Might for a fat 40% damage reduction application. It's the worst of the two options for essence regeneration, but who cares about essence regeneration when you're dead? Bone Splinters I felt was kind of useless throughout the dungeon as my other forms of essence regeneration allowed me to permacast Bone Spear without worry. It was the best generator against the Seekers, but because I wasn't using Blood Mist for invulnerability or Reap for more damage reduction, I would die more often versus the Seekers, but I could output the most damage over the fight length due to its ability to regenerate my essence on my damage cycles. Blood Mist was fun to use during the dungeon, just to guarantee the safety of the pole happening and then let loose my damage cycle, but it was still less DPS than using Reap and that it slower dungeon clear times to spawn the Seekers. Versus the Seekers, I found myself living the longest, but because of the essence generation issues without using a generator, I dealt little damage to the Seekers and it took quite a long time to kill them. Regardless, the defense of nature allowed for the longest possible fight to occur. The skill tree associated with each variant can be found in the planner below. For sacrifices, I found the current setup of the Defender Warriors, Cold Mages, and Iron Golem sacrifices were the best in every variant. For gear, let's start with the helm. I first want to start off by saying that I found running Shaco was not optimal as it prevented me from being able to hit the 14,100 armor breakpoint in either variant, so I don't believe it's the best option. For affixes, I found that max life, barrier generation, total armor percentage, and max essence with the ruby was the best option. For aspects, we have three options. Aspect of Disobedience, Aspect of Explosive Miss, and Aspect of Might. Aspect of a Disobedience allowed me to have the most damage because I didn't need to hit 14,100 base armor and can instead opt into more options for damage in my Paragon. Aspect of Might is good for Seeker engagement as it allows for 20% damage reduction in the engagement. Simply by casting the basic skill, we get it to activate. We don't actually have to hit anything with the basic skill. If you run, decide to run this aspect, know that you have to hit that 14,100 base armor and therefore lose out on quite a bit of damage in the Paragon. 
Aspect of Explosive Mist synergizes incredibly well with the Corpse Miasma activating the Darkness Cliff, as well as guarantees a surefire optimal engagement on the Seekers. You will have to achieve the 14,100 base armor, so we lose some damage in the Paragon, but it is the safest option versus the Seekers. For the chest, I found running max life, total armor, barrier generation, and damage reduction from shadow damage over time affected enemies with two rubies was the best option for all variants. For the aspect, we run Aspect of Shilling Storm. For gloves, I run critical hit chance, attack speed, ranks of bone spear, and lucky hit resource generation with the Aspect of Serration. For pants, I found that running Tibalt's Will was the best option just because of how much damage I received for the max resource affects, damage multiplier, and essence regeneration passive in tandem with Metamorphosis Vampiric Power. For boots, we have two options. We can run Legendary Boots with Essence Cost Reduction, Movement Speed, Intelligence, and Ranks to Corpse Tendrils with the Ghost Walker Aspect and Evade Grants 75% Move Speed Passive. This allows for the fastest movement throughout the dungeon, but I don't believe it's the safest option for the dungeon or the best option for the Seekers. The other option is Flicker Step. This allows near permanent Bone Storm upkeep, which is vital versus the Seekers, but also allows better Bone Storm shielding throughout the dungeon, as your own Bone Storm will give the most value from the Shielding Storm aspect. I personally recommend using these. Also, quick note, you do not need to hit anything with an attack to activate the passive of the flicker step reducing the evade cooldown. Simply casting two bone spears or two generator attacks in any direction allowed my evade to reset its cooldown and I was able to move through the dungeon surprisingly quick. For the weapons, there are three main options with a hot swap for the seeker engagement. The three main options are Black River, Doombringer, and a wand with splintering aspect for the entire dungeon, and for the hot swap we run any weapon with aspect of ultimate shadow. Black River netted out by far the fastest dungeon clears due to its ability to permanently keep out our Flesh Eater and Essence Regeneration through detonation of multiple corpses with Grim Harvest. So for the dungeon clear, this is what I found to be the most effective. Doombringer was by far the best option versus the Singers for me as it gives a massive 41.4% max life increase, a passive that deals shadow damage for our damage reduction, and adds another form of enemies dealing less damage. The problem with running it is now we lose our ability to regenerate Essence more efficiently and lose optimal Flesh Eater uptime because we lose the Black River passive and increase ranks to huge Flesh allowing for more corpse detonations. Still, even though we lose these passives, I felt Doombringer was the best play for us as the Seekers. The third option is a Legendary Wand with a Splintering Aspect and then utilizing Aspect of Exposed Flesh on the ring instead. This is really good Essence Management option for the dungeon, but because we're not running Doombringer, it's not optimal for Seekers and you have a higher chance of dying. Another option is to run Aspect of Ultimate Shadow and Splintering in the ring, which is really nice for keeping up our damage reduction and activating Darkness Glyph easily so it's tankier for the Seekers, but we have Sacrifice Essence Management and trust me when I say you will feel it on the Seekers, and run out of Essence really fast. Though both options are good ideas, in practice, Black River had better average clear times for the dungeon and Doombringer had better performance against the Seekers. It's a decent middle ground if you don't have any gear swaps via the Black River and Doombringer and will do well in Tier 7s, but it starts to fall off around the Tier 8 area and above. The last option is a quick hot swap to any weapon with Aspect of Ultimate Shadow. The idea is before the Seekers spawn, you equip it, activate Bone Storm, and then hot swap back to Doombringer. This now allows for the first Bone Storm to deal shadow damage and stacks the Darkness Glyph faster, allowing for maximum defensive potential on the initial engagement against the Seekers. I found that in theory this is really good, but in practice I had a really hard time properly executing this and didn't notice too much of a damage reduction gain. It's definitely the min-max limit play, but it's very difficult to pull off properly. For the amulet, we will run a legendary amulet with essence cost reduction, avulsion, damage reduction from shadow damage over time affected enemies, and then total armor percentage or cooldown reduction roll with aspect of grasping veins. The total armor percentage roll is using the 14,100 base armor variant, and the cooldown reduction roll is using the disobedience variant. In my last video, I said splintering aspect in the amulet nets out the most DPS, and it does, but only if you can hit all five shards against the target. When facing the Seekers, you will very rarely hit all five shards against any of them, and therefore having Aspect of Grasping Veins in this slot will allow you to easily break the 90% crit hit chance breakpoint and allow for very hard hitting main spears, rather than depending on all five shards hitting the squirrely targets in melee range. For Ring Slot 1, we will run Ring of the Sacrilegious for any variant. This ring allows for automatic detonation of corpses to apply Miasma without losing DPS from casting other spells in our rotation and stacks up Flesh Eater. It's too strong of a ring, and I highly discourage not running it. For ring slot 2, we will run a legendary ring with critical hit chance, maximum life, maximum essence, and barrier generation. For the aspect, we can either run aspect of exposed flesh or splintering aspect, and this is dependent on whether you opt into running Black River and Doombringer for your run, or a legendary wand with whatever aspect selection as discussed before. If you run Black River and Doombringer, or a legendary wand with aspect of ultimate shadow, you will run splintering here. If you run a legendary wand with splintering aspect, then you will run aspect of exposed flesh. The option is up to you. I personally recommend the former, keeping splintering aspect in the ring. For the offhand, we have two options. We can run Lidless Wall or a Shield with maximum life, barrier generation, essence cost reduction, and resource generation with the aspect of might. 
Both will run a ruby in the jewelry slot. You can run a focus with splintering aspect or aspect of exposed flesh in ring one or aspect of ultimate shadow and splintering aspect in ring one, but it will diminish your armor below the threshold for either variant that opts for damage in the paragon board with disobedience or armor and resistance in the paragon board and trying to achieve the 14,100 base armor without disobedience as shields give armor. Because of this, I don't recommend it, but it is an option. Lidless performed better for the dungeon, but the legendary shield performed better on the seekers. Therefore, I recommend hot swapping before the seekers spawn, but if you do not have a legendary shield, you can still run Lidless and it will perform well. All right, now let's talk Paragon. Now, as we're moving forward into this Paragon board selection, I'm not going to go into detail of literally every single node in the selection of like what's going on here because I don't need to, I don't feel like I need to drown out my audience with like useless information. I think most people kind of have the basic gist of like what's going down with Paragon boards, right? So what I want to discuss here is kind of like the conceptualization between disobedience damage defense and then the 14,100 armor breakpoint damage defense. So let's talk about like what disobedience and then the 14k armor differences are. So in disobedience variants, we're not trying to grab every single armor anymore. We're not focused on grabbing all of the armor nodes. And instead what we're trying to opt into is more damage oriented selection across the board. As for the 14k armor, obviously now what we're trying to do is we're trying to grab every single armor and that allows us to hit that 14,100 armor breakpoint. And so that's basically the difference between the disobedience and the 14k armor. But now we need to talk about the damage and defense. So what's going on with damage is what we're trying to do is turn flesh eater into our fourth board. And what this does is it allows us to turn on stifle and targeted. It also allows us to focus more into the essence cliff and kind of pump it up so that we have maximum essence cliff utilization. And then for our fifth board, we're just going to utilize another glyph. And what this does now is it allows us to run corporeal instead of opting out of corporeal. Now we can run it. So we're running five glyphs in this version. Now in the defensive version, what's happening is we are switching the fourth and fifth boards. Now flesh eater becomes our fifth board and now wither becomes our fourth board. And the reason we do this is so that we can turn on dragging shadows because this is another form of, of damage reduction. And then throughout the board, we opt into more resistances and more armor, as you can see. So when we're trying to go like full fledged into one direction or not, because disobedience is trying to go more of a damage direction, disobedience damage is like the perfected board for using disobedience with damage. In this version, we have essence all the way pumped up. We're able to have stifle. We have targeted. We have everything completely pumped up. We're using five glyphs. We This is maximum AC 130 levels of damage. And then when we're using the 14K armor, defense variant is really strong because we got wither turned online, but we also have every single max life and armor node grabbed on the entire board. So this is our most defensive version. This is the M1 A1 Abrams tank version of Bone Spear. Now, if you want to opt into middle or more like hybrid variants of those, we have a 14k armor damage and we have a disobedience defense version. But I feel that whatever version you decide to move forward with, it's probably going to be disobedience damage or it's going to be the 14k armor defense, whichever one you opt into. But I want to give my audience the option and kind of inspiration to like what the idea is her and you can modify these boards as you wish however you so feel at feet but this is what i feel is the most effective Lastly, let's discuss vampiric powers. We have three that I found I run in any variant being Metamorphosis, Prey the Weak, and Ravenous. Metamorphosis makes us unstoppable, which will activate Tybalt's Will Multiplier and Essence Regeneration. Ravenous is just an amazing attack speed steroid, which skyrockets our DPS, and Prey the Weak is a consistently strong 16% multiplier to our damage. From here, we have options for the last two powers. I believe the most viable options here are Anticipation, Domination, Resilience, and Moonrise. Let's explain all four, and then I will give my personal recommendation. Anticipation gives us 12 seconds off our Bone Storm cooldown, as is the first thing calculated within the inverse multiplier equation for cooldown reduction, so it receives its full benefit of the 20%. This is super strong, and that it allows for the best Bone Storm uptime potential, and I found it incredibly powerful, especially for the Seekers. Domination is a fat 24% multiplier to things that are CC'd and will allow for fast dungeon clears, but it loses value against the Seekers and anything above tier 9, as we can no longer kill elite mobs nor the Seekers in a single damage cycle, and they will become unstoppable, which deactivates the power. Resilience is really good when those teleporter seekers decide to reposition and remove your barrier generation from shielding storm because it's no longer hitting anything. With the seeker aspect still on the ground but no barrier generation, this means you have a small window of time that you are susceptible to the affix damage and start taking hits to your actual HP. This in turn kicks resilience into gear and allows you to reposition back into the seeker and start reapplying your shielding storm with less risk of dying. Lastly, there's Moonrise. If you are running Reap, then one swipe with Reap against a mob pack will activate it, giving a massive 20% attack speed steroid. With Bone Splinters, we only need to cast it twice as it has three instances of damage that each count as a stack and in turn online, giving a massive attack speed steroid, which is incredibly powerful versus the dungeon for clearing the mob packs quicker and the Seekers for stacking Essence back up quickly for another damage cycle. Another note is that it's strength and resetting the Flicker Stip of aid. My personal recommendation is Anticipation and Resilience for both variants, but the other two options are still viable if you feel you enjoy them more.
Alrighty, that's everything for build options. Now let's talk about combining all these pieces together for two variants I personally found performed the best, being the Blood Mist option and the Generator option. I will put a disclaimer that these builds aren't objectively the best options, as some of you may prefer a different playstyle, and builds are always improving. But it's what I found personally the best for my playstyle at this time. Moving forward, I will have three links below, being one for the D4 planner on Max Roll and two for Mobilytics for all you phone users, because don't you have phones? The D4 planner link will have literally every gear option, skill tree, and paragon board option in one link. The Mobilytics links will have the primary dungeon set up, and then in the build summary below, we'll detail the hot swaps and when to use them. Let's start with the Blood Mist option that I will completely and originally, with no inspiration to the name whatsoever, called Infinimus Spear. In the D4 planner, this is the Infinimus Spear dungeon, Infinimus Spear Seeker, and Hot Swap Pre Seeker tabs for equipment. We will be opting into having 14,000 base armor, so we will run the armor percentage in the amulet, aspect of explosive mist in the helm, the skulls in the jewelry. We will keep Doombringer and a weapon with aspect of ultimate shadow in our inventory, prepped for a gear swap for Seekers. We will be running Blood Mist for our sixth skill. Infinimus Spear tab for skills, opting for points in Blood Mist branch. 14,000 defense tab for Paragon, running every single armor, resistance, and max life node available to us. And lastly, for Vampiric Powers, will be running Metamorphosis, Prey the Weak, Ravenous, Anticipation, and Resilience. This variant of the build is the tank version of Bone Spear. It's nearly impossible to die in the standard dungeon and very resilient against the Seekers. It runs max resistances, 77.3% base damage reduction without resilience stacked, three forms of reducing the damage that enemies deal through Decrepify, Darkness Glyph, and Doombringer when facing Seekers, 63% barrier generation, and a whopping 25,000 max life while also being able to utilize the power of Blood Mist to restack our barrier or reapply Darkness Glyph stacks to a Teleporter Seeker. This has the highest chance to survive against the Seekers, and you will almost never die in the regular dungeon. What this version sacrifices to have this extreme tankiness is the ability to generate Essence. To play this best when against the Seekers, if you run out of Essence, manually cast Corpse Explosion 2-3 to three times to reset Flicker Steps, Evade, and Dash. You will gain 50 Essence every 2.5 seconds when doing this right, and permanently keep up your Bone Storm. If you are newer to Bone Spear, or transferring from Infinimist to try out a different build for Abattoir Zir, I recommend running this variant as it will be the easier of the two to transition to with your brain already trained to play Infinimist, and it is more forgiving on mistakes being made to newer Bone Spear players. If you are an experienced Bone Spear player, or someone like me who is a masochist but loves dealing maximum DPS, then let's discuss the next version, which is the Reaper Spear variant. In a D4 planner, this is the Reaper Spear Dungeon, Reaper Spear Seeker, and Hot Swap Pre-Seeker tabs for equipment. We'll be opting into not having 14,000 base armor, so we run Disobedience in our helmet, cooldown reduction in the amulet, and gems to maximize our resistances in our jewelry. Sometimes we can hit the maximum resistances with one to two slots open for jewelry, so instead you can insert skulls for more armor. This means you need less stacks of Disobedience to meet the threshold and get to the 14,100 armor faster. We will keep Doombringer, Shield with Aspect of Might, and a weapon with Aspect of Ultimate Shadow in our inventory prepped for a gear swap for Seekers. We will be running Reap as our sixth skill, Reaper Spear tab for skills utilizing Rapid Ossification, Disobedience Damage tab for Paragon opting into maximum damage output while still meeting specific defensive threshold points, and lastly for Vampiric Powers we will be running Metamorphosis, Prey the Weak, Ravenous Anticipation, and Resilience. This variant of the build is the AC-130 version of Bone Spear. It outputs the most DPS of all versions of the Bone Spear while still meeting max resistances, 67.3% base damage reduction, three forms of reducing the damage that enemies deal through Decrepify, Darkness, Glyph, and the Gloombringer when facing the Seekers, 63% barrier generation in the dungeon, and 84% barrier generation versus Seekers, and it's still a respectable 23,000 max life. This variant clears the dungeon like a joke, and outputs damage like a Gatling cannon, with Bone Spears dealing 4 to 5 million base damage per hit with a one-handed weapon at 3 attacks per second. What this version sacrifices in its extreme damage output is the ability to utilize Blood Mist to restack our barrier or reapply Darkness stacks to a Teleporter Seeker. To play this best when against the Seekers, make sure to cast Reap every 6 seconds to keep up Might. If you run out of Essence, cast Reap 2 times to reset Flicker, Step, Evade, and Dash. You will gain 50 Essence every 2.5 seconds when doing this right and permanently keep up your Bone Storm. If you are an experienced Bone Spear player or want to challenge yourself with the highest DPS output, I recommend running this variant as it will be the stronger of the two when comparing damage output while still meeting the defensive thresholds needed for the Seekers. This build is extremely unforgiving to mistakes against the Seekers. If you mess up your engagement without disobedience stacked, you position incorrectly to have Bone Storm hitting multiple Seekers, you forget to utilize your Flicker Steps to reduce your Bone Storm cooldown and it falls off, forget to cast Reap to utilize Aspect of Might, you have a very high chance of dying. This is the version I run as it speed clears tier 8s in like 3.5 half minutes average. 
That's all I have for you today. The main thesis point between both variants is discussing amongst each other what's better. The utility of Blood Mist, which makes us invulnerable and restacks our damage reduction modifiers, or Reap, that can generate essence, give insane attack speed on damage cycles throughout the dungeon, apply shadow damage, and also give us 40% more damage reduction. Though Bone Spear may not be the most optimal option for Necromancers and Avatar Zir, it's still a very engaging, fun, and rewarding build to play. It opens up new topics to discuss as we move forward into Season 3 for Necromancers when discussing speed builds versus endgame options. It also is important to know the Abattoir of Zero was specifically tuned to the defensive prowess and damage output of the unbalanced Hoda Barbarians and Ball Lightning Sorks this season. So though it may feel rough for us now, in this alpha testing for endgame content, it does not mean this is what was going to happen moving forward. If you liked the video, make sure to support me and let's get this video to a thousand likes. Subscribe if you want notifications for future content, and most importantly, if you have any questions at all, comment below. I love being able to have discourse with my wonderful audience. Thank you all for your time, and have a wonderful day. Operator Otter, 